we won. Best we won. Superstar, sensational game here at the Devils Playground. 12 seconds remaining. Brisbane Bullets lead by one. Carfino goes for it. And puts it in the hole. Five, four, three, two, one. It's all over. of the year. The Bullets have been locked up. The Devils have won. Made sensational. What a finish. Sensational. Yes. First we won. 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 Hello, everybody, and welcome. It is NBL Rewind. Cam Luke, Liam, Santa Maria, and we are we winding it back, of course. Announcement today, more exciting news. The feeling around the fact that the Tasmanian team in the NBL is going to enter somewhat real soon. And obviously, we're there last year for the NBL Blitz, Liam, Santa Maria. So it was time to hit rewind and get back to Tassie Devils and look at a, a great game. Be joined by a legend who we'll get to in a split second. How are you doing, my man? I'm good, man. This was a fun game to, to watch. It went <laughs> right down to the wire. Our man... <laughs> Got the job done with yes. the winning bucket, tore the, the whole thing up, and uh, it was a big night for Tassie Hoops uh, that night back in 1986. There is one thing that happened in this game that I'm going to push for to return to NBL arenas around the country that the NBL, Larry Kesselman, and Jeremy LaLiga are not going to like. So we'll get to that very shortly. Okay, we will welcome, though, Steve Carfino. And an added extra, too. So many of these NBL Rewind games we've been doing commentated by our man, Steve Carfino, who was brilliant down in Hobart. Of course, NBL Hall of Famer. Hey, doing, man? Welcome. I'm good, good. Thanks for having me on, guys. Of course, I'm a big fan. You know, like, I'm an NBL fan. So, um, you know, I love the, the, well, not just you guys, but obviously Homicide on there. And you guys are the perfect combination with Corey. <laughs> you know what? Well, anytime you want to try and deal with him, feel free to jump on the set, man, because it's a full-time job, Liam, and i got to work on. But it's a lot of fun, no doubt. Hey, before we get to this game, and it's a wonderful game. If for people at home who haven't watched it yet, NBL TV, Twitch, Facebook, Instagram, however you watch your NBL content, jump on and check this game out from 1986. But I want to talk a little bit about the lead up to how you ended up out of, you know, college, NBA draft, how you ended up down there in Tasmania as part of the Devils. How did, how did this all happen, mate? Because, you know, you're over in the States doing your thing. Next thing you know, hitting game winners in Tassie. Yeah, you know, it's an interesting story. I mean, Dave Atkins was the coach there, and he helped um, start the league in 1979. And so Dave was from Iowa, and that's where I went to school, at the University of Iowa. I played for Lute Olson before he went to Arizona. And Dave saw me play in school, and then he, you know, obviously just didn't think of me right out of the blue. Um, he had been asked if he wanted to coach the Hobart Devils. And so, you know, he's contemplating whether he's going to do it or not. And he runs into an old teammate of mine who lived in Des Moines, Iowa at the time, and a guy named Steve Waite. And he was like, I'm thinking about um, coaching over in Hobart. And I'm thinking about, you know, back then everybody went with two big imports. Um, and so he's, I'm thinking about taking a point guard and a big man, you know, I'm thinking of taking Steve Carfino and, and Steve Waite was really kind and said some nice things about me. And so that was when the recruitment of me began in Hobart. But the interesting thing was, um, you know, there's no mobile phones back then. So it's not like you just pick up the call and, hey, it's Australia. It wasn't like that. So they had to call the athletic department to get to the basketball office. And they just got a receptionist. And so on the same day, it was really weird, on the same, I found this out later when Brian Gorgian told me, on the same day, uh, Brian Gorgian calls for me to play, I believe he was coaching Ballarat or something back then. Old CBA. Right. So he calls, and then Dave Atkins calls from Iowa, but he said he was, you know, um, going to coach in Australia. So I just assumed they were the same phone calls that <laughs> – that Australia had rung me. And so I, I just randomly just called Dave. He was the first person she, she gave me the, the number. I called Dave and then I, you know, I went with that opportunity in Hobart, but I mean, I could have played for Brian Gorge and it was, it was that close. So I had gone there to um, go back and finish my degree at the university of Iowa. So I was playing against BJ Armstrong, Roy Marble, Les Jepsen, Ed Horton. They had a team that had that was uh, uh, Kevin Gamble who played with the Celtics, and so they had a, a team that was absolutely loaded. And so I was playing against those guys because I was just playing pickup games. Mm -hmm. 
so I felt like my game was, you know, was really sharp. And so I get this opportunity to play in Australia. And the worst thing is when guys go over and they, they get sent back home. So here I go to Hobart and, um, and I'm, for one, I've gone, I played the University of Iowa, you know, I never played in front of an empty seat. We, our place had 17,000 people. Our locker room had concert speakers. Um, we were on statewide television. You know, I couldn't leave campus without, if I was signing autographs, I had to do it while I was walking. We were like a, a, a big deal. Um, as a matter of fact, when we were on statewide television, I was voted the second oh. sexiest man on television next to Tom Hanks. <laughs> I, I tell you what, this actually makes me think, I wouldn't mind seeing you, a little castaway beard, you know, don't shave for three years and see what happens. Because, uh, you know, Tom Hanks obviously didn't look as good with the big beard. So maybe you'd be able to beat him finally, what, oh, 35 years later? I can't pull off a beard at all. <laughs> I don't know, because I've got gray hair and my, my beard is, is gray. I look like um, a cross between Morgan Freeman um, and, I don't know, somebody else who's oh. got a gray beard. I'll ask you this, if you, you know, obviously it's a prestigious award or at least a, a nomination to be involved in that list. Did that like you, make you like Tom Hanks more or less? Did he been able to knock you off? No, because, because no, I'm sorry, did I, say, did I say Tom Hanks? I meant yeah. Tom Selleck because he, oh. he was Magnum P.I. Of, of course. Yeah, yeah. Either way, what did you think of Tom Selleck? Did you like him more or less? <laughs> um, no, I was a big fan. It was, yeah. it was kind of, my teammates <laughs> used to really tease me about it, but you know, so I go to Hobart and mm -hmm. um, our first training session is like at Warren. It was on the, you know, the other side of the bridge um, that they, when, when, when boats go under the bridge, they, you know, they stop the traffic. I mm -hmm. never could figure right. that one out. But, um, and, and I had to pay to get into training. It cost me a $2 coin to get in. I, I had just gone from the University of Iowa where like, you know, practically every player had a manager and a trainer and, you know, you get your ankles taped and, um, you know, everything that you could possibly think of to go into play for Hobart where I had to pay to train. So it was a, it was a big eye opener for me. Um, we played against the Olverson Red Hoppers in a preseason game. And, um, but I just, you know, I found out how much I love the game. You know, we we're able to, to take basketball to an unsuspecting public because we were two and 24 the previous year. And so, um, you know, like our team had terrible habits. So the first day of training, I played for Lute Olsen. So we're doing a seven and one drill where I'm denying the, the wing and my teammates couldn't get the ball. I was in shape. I was afraid of being sent home. Um, you know, I was motivated. Uh, it was my first opportunity to play somewhat professional because I folded rugby shirts in those little cubicles at Canterbury, you know, and that was my job during the day. And then in the afternoon, I would I would work and they gave me a, a flat and a car and I made $183 a week. And I was probably the happiest man in Australia to be playing ball. When, uh, when I went back and watched this game last night, the, it took me about 15 minutes to work out which lines on the court were the basketball <laughs> lines. You talk about coming over from Iowa from the big stage. Like how, when you first walked out onto that court, did that slap you in the face? Like how many sports do they play on this thing? Oh, yeah. I mean, we used to get at least three violations on every visiting team that came through. They'd go to make a move and both of their feet would be out of bounds. You know, like it was it was really an experience to play on that court. But probably the biggest thing that shocked me was, you know, we had played at um, Michigan State. And after they had Magic Johnson and that great team with Jay Vincent and, and Greg Kelster, um, and they won the national tournament, beating Larry Bird in that in that final in '79. Um, it was they had a brand new floor, and it was like super cushioned and bouncy. And so I'm playing in Hobart, and I'm playing on a basically a kitchen floor. It's like a linoleum, uh, <laughs> lime green. Uh, <laughs> it was really ugly. It was a multi-purpose hall, and and that was our home court, you know, and. I would be icing my knees and players didn't really ice their knees back in those days. You know, they're looking at me like, you know, what are you doing? I said, well, my knees are swollen from playing on this court, but it was, uh, it was definitely, you know, like, and as a matter of fact, the first training session, I've, I've left this bit out. The first training session, I'm going to take a shower and it was cold and damp and freezing in there. And I look down and there's a huntsman on my foot. Mm -hmm. Like, but I had never seen a husband, hus, huntsman before. I thought it was a tarantula, you know? So I kick it off and grab my shoe and I just beat it to death. 
<laughs> squash it. I mean, everybody's everybody's pissed off at me because I just killed this, you know, non-poisonous spider. Yeah, scared me to death. Hey, um, you mentioned the Celtics before. Let's take it a little bit further back. Obviously, that famous 1984 draft. You were selected late in the uh, in the sixth round. Tell us about the little the period of time there where you were a Celtic from that draft mm. night to a couple of months later when you weren't. Yeah, well, I mean, uh, let me tell, let me go back even a little further than that. The day, the draft day. So you know, like you know, there are the people that are there, and then there's you know the rest of us who are hoping to you know go in the second round or something. And so um, I think a guy named Steve Burt played at Iona. Um, with a guy named Gary Springer, who was like a nationally ranked high school player. And so he, they were like, and I can't remember what team it was. Pick Steve. You know, it's in the second round. I think I'm going. And it wasn't Carfino. And so, uh, and, and people are all say, you were a part of that 84 draft. And I'm proud of that. You know, and the older I get, the more proud I am of the things that I was able to accomplish, whether it be, yeah. you know, at Iowa being all Big Ten or getting drafted in that 84 draft or playing in Hobart, playing with the Sydney Kings, um, instead of being disappointed. You know, when you're a player, you're disappointed if you don't win the championship. Right. You're, right. you're disappointed if you miss a, you know, a game winner. You mm -hmm. know, and as you get older, you're like, you know, wow, you know, I, I got a lot of mileage out of this body, you know, like right. I was able to accomplish some good things. So, um, yeah, it was it, it was it was interesting when I, when I was drafted in the sixth round, I was kind of embarrassed about that. I was the last pick of the sixth round. Mm -hmm. I was embarrassed because I thought I would go higher. And now I just go. I do tell people that they're like, oh, that's an amazing achievement. But they're mm -hmm. thinking that there's like two rounds. I was like, no, there were 10. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, there were 10. That yeah. was the last pick of the 10th round. No, heck. Like, you were drafted in the 84 draft. That's all there needs to be to it. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, like now I'm, I'm quite proud of that. And, mm -hmm. and I will tell people, I won't hide behind the fact that there were 10 rounds, but I do say that, you know, I'm very proud that I was drafted by the Boston Celtics. I got to meet um, some of the Celtic players. You know, um, Kevin McHale had gone to a um, – uh, pre-draft tournament my brother went with her they played in the pizza classic in las vegas and so my brother had met kevin McHale, and um, minnesota was on probation at that point in time so my brother had never seen kevin McHale play on national television because they were on probation and so they were talking you know because they were roommates and um he said oh when do you think you'll go he said oh probably you know second or third and so my brother's thinking second or third round, but you know, Kevin was like second or third pick. Yeah. And so my brother was like, who is this guy? And so they were up gambling all night, you know, cause they were in Vegas. My brother scores two points and Kevin McHale had like 32. It was like the MVP of the game. So, uh, so he, when I got to Boston's camp, Kevin McHale was like, Hey, little Carfino. And I thought, and he was like, come on, you know, show me what you got. So I think I, here's an opportunity for me to, you know, school Kevin McHale and make the team um and he blocked like my first three shots and I think I I think they didn't pick me on that team <laughs> from that point on right there was a chance to make it or a chance not to make it and right. I didn't make it you had about just, 10 minutes yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, just just on that you mentioned it before obviously when it comes to the phone calls and the receptionist uh, and you know because obviously it was a much different world technology wise of course the NBA draft wouldn't have been televised to the sixth round I assume oh no was it so no, how, did, no. how did you find out? How, did, how does it find out that you've been drafted? Um, I honestly don't remember. I think that okay. they called my house. And, yeah, okay. uh, and my, by that time, you know, I, after the second round, I, I was like, well, you know, I don't, I, you know, there's a chance I wasn't going to get drafted. So I just went and played golf with my dad and my brother and tried to get my mind off of it. And I came home and my mom told me that the, the Boston Celtics had drafted me. So, so going to that camp, I thought, okay, well, chances are, you know, because I have an older brother who was drafted by Golden State. Mm -hmm. He went in the fifth round four years previous. And so um, he got like a cool practice jersey. And, and uh, Lorenzo Romar, who was the coach at Washington, ended up making that team. And my brother and him were like high school rivals. My brother was always the better of the two. But Lorenzo Romar just, you know, had that work ethic and, um, you know, he performed on the week and he makes the team. But I thought when I was at Boston's camp, I would, at the very least, 
get like a practice jersey or some type of memorabilia that I could remember it by. But we just played shirts and skins. We stayed in like a, it was like a summer camp. We stayed in this barn, you know, of a dormitory. Um, I was in, you know, like there were like three people living in it in one big giant dormitory. It was uh, Rick Carlisle who uh, kept in touch with me for years after we hung out because we were like really tight when we went there. And John Sally, who ended up, um, I was on, I was, uh, I was in Australia and I wanted to go to this television show called The Best Damn show, Sports Show, period. And John Sally was one of the co-hosts on it. And um, Kevin, was it not? Tom Arnold, Tom Arnold was on the show as well. And so when I, when my executive producer, who was Sol Stein, called to, um, this something Greenberg was the executive producer of the best damn show, sports show period. He said, I've got this guy, Steve Carfino. He's a, he was a basketball player. Now he's a commentator and he works on our basketball shows. And so Tom Arnold was sitting in the office back then. He was like, Carfino, because Tom Arnold's from Iowa. He was oh, like, Carfino, oh. man, I remember him when he played for the Hawkeyes. And then I got on the show and John Sally was like, oh, that's my boy, Stevie. Yeah, we were at Boston's camp together. So you know, like, as we all know, basketball is such a small world. Mm -hmm. You know, you're always bumping into people um, in the weirdest places who, you know, who remember you from back when you played in a, a BCI tournament in Provo, Utah, when you're in high school, you know, like, oh, yeah, you know, I was the manager for that. You know, like, it, it's such a small world. It always blows me away how often these stories turn into, yeah, I was there. I saw that, you know. It's, it's funny. You, you said going back playing some pickup, like what, what, and you're getting your, your degree. What, what was in your mind? Were you looking to try and find a pro job overseas or were you thinking maybe you'll stay in the States and go to the old school CBA or maybe even sort of give up basketball? What was that period of time like for you? Yeah, when the, when the Celtics let me go, it, was, it happened to be on my birthday, August 28th, oh, back in 1984. Um, I, you know, I just came back and I was in Iowa. And as, as I said, you know, I was like a, a celebrity in the state of Iowa. And so a guy approached me to have a sporting goods store. It was called Carfino's Action Sports. And I just didn't want to be that guy that was, you know, wasn't going to make it in the NBA and just bounce around from one CBA team to another. And interesting um, that the uh, team from Albany gave me a call. So Phil Jackson actually gave me a call to see if I was interested in playing in the CBA, but I had that sports sporting goods store going. And I thought, oh, you know, I'll do the right thing and just start, you know, building on a, a life after basketball. Mm -hmm. And so I'm playing like in summer leagues, I go home, I play in the Compton College Summer League, um, which is another interesting story. I'll keep it quick, but um, I played against a guy named Raymond Lewis, who is the all-time greatest streetball player of, in L.A.'s history. And he had 71 on me. <laughs> 71. You can look it up. <laughs> you can look it up because the very next week, he had like 56 on Michael Cooper, who was the best defender mm -hmm. in the NBA at that point in time, according to Larry Bird. Mm -hmm. And so I was playing in these summer leagues and playing quite well. And uh, remember, Liam, remember um, Dane Suttle? No, he played for he played for Geelong, and he was like, he was a great scorer. Uh -huh. um, he played on that Pepperdine team that lost to NC State when they had that march to the finals and beat right. Houston, and, you know that five slam slam a jamma team. Yeah, yeah. And so, um, but Dane played in that summer league, and I was playing really well. And so I just thought, you know, like a lot of these guys are playing overseas. You know, I want to put the word out there that I'm going to play. I want to play overseas. And then I got, I went back to get my degree in communications at the University of Iowa. And that was when I was playing with BJ and all those guys in pickup games uh, while I was on campus. I just went for the first semester between August and, and December. And, um, and so that's, that's when I was playing in, in those pickup games and felt like I, you know, I wanted to play overseas. And then I got the phone call from Australia and you know, I spoke to Dave and, and, and embarked on my Australian journey, which I am still <laughs> in right now. <laughs> yeah. And so then when you, when you come over, you go to Hobart with Dave Atkins and it was their fourth season in the league, right? And in their first three seasons, two wins, four wins, two mm -hmm. wins, eight wins from 70 plus games. And then you come in and things start picking up. What, what was the vibe around town in Hobart in that 86 season when you were having wins like, like this one against the Bullets? Well, 
Yeah. Um, are you guys still there? Yeah, we got you. Oh, okay. I thought you were frozen. Sorry about that. Um, you know, we went from like the joke of Hobart to like rock stars of Hobart and we were nine and 17, but in those nine wins, we kept knocking off the top team on the table. You know, it was like, um, the Sydney, um, what were they? The supersonics Mm -hmm. came in, knocked them off. Canberra cannons knocked them off. Um, we were beating some very good teams. And so, the crowd went from like hardly any people there to, to a fire hazard. And then everywhere we go, like say, for example, if I went to um, go, for, go for dinner, um, people were just like, you know, giving me food, you know, go to my Italian restaurant here, take this one home with you. Oh, don't worry about it. Or, you know, I would go to um, the butcher at my, you know, just around a corner from my place. And his wife would, you know, prepare a meal for me. All I had to do was boil rice and put this in uh, the stir fry in and just put it over. She'd tell me how to do it. You know, like it it was it was amazing. It was amazing thing to go from um, a program that, you know, had no expectations and um, and terrible habits and being a part of the growth of them to get to go from having no respect to you know, everybody wants us to get on a a local radio station or a local TV station and, you know, do like a, uh, cook a recipe, you know, (laughs) on Taz TV, something like that. So it was, um, it was really, it was really special. I I think that that's probably the the most satisfying thing to go from, you know, no respect to a a bunch of respect and, and be able to inspire other people to, you know, try and, do whatever it is that they're doing better. So it was, it was a really special time. And this particular game is so fun to watch. And yet again, if you haven't watched it, jump on Twitch, NBL TV, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, wherever you get your content, because it's a cool game to watch. You would have been loving life because outside of the free meals, which is something you're not allowed to do in college, obviously, you had the green light. Oh, <laughs> you yeah. Had the yeah. Green light. <laughs> <laughs> it was funny. We were watching um, my, my brother. I, I got some footage of those games and, my brother's watching a game um, where I miss a shot. We get the rebound. They kick it back to me. I miss the shot. And they kick it back to me. And I drive off somebody. And I go up to shoot. And my brother, as I'm, like, you know, getting my steps together, getting my one-two together to pull up quick, my brother's like, no. Like, you're not going to shoot again. Yeah. You know? And I ended up, like, jumping up and firing one to somebody for a layup because they were like, no one else is going to shoot anyway. So, guys, like, at three guys, I mean, I kick one to Murray Shields, and he lays it up, and it – and it goes in. And, um, and, but I mean, I had the fluorescent green light. It was so much fun because I was a role player at Iowa. We had two centers. We had a guy named Michael Payne and a guy named Greg Stokes. We had Bobby Hansen, who was the off guard for us there, who, you know, played with on that Bulls team where Michael Jordan, you know, got so hot, he went like that. And um, so we had a lot of talent. I was just a role player. And so all of a sudden I'm asked, I was like, you, you, you need to get 30 for us to have a shot. Right. And, you know, that was that was something that took me like a hot New York minute to adjust to. <laughs> <laughs> well, there you go my next question, because I was like, did you have to work into this role? But clearly not. One session down, boom, away you go. Yeah, I think that, you know, the toughest part about that is when you're a role player, um, you know, like the toughest thing to do when you're tired is probably, you know, in the matchup zone or on a switch and the shot goes up, you got to block out a guy that's like a six foot nine glass eating rebounder, you know, like that's probably the thing that physically is the most tacting on you Uh, or you've got to chase somebody around that comes off of a lot of ball screens as a role player Um, but as a go-to player you got to make plays when you're tired you got to hit free throws when you're tired you got to make something out of nothing late in the shot clock when you're tired and that was the biggest adjustment for me to go from a role player to um, you know to the star player and that responsibility, you know, like, because it didn't always go well. You have to have you, you have to have a lot thicker skin, you know, when when you're the guy that people depend on for your team to be successful. But I mean, it was it was something that was it was it was so much fun, you know, like the hard work that it took to. And I think I shot like 49 percent from the field and I took mm. tough shots that year. Mm. Um, well. So my confidence was just sky high. I remember the first game the first week of the season we played against Brisbane so we're on the road played against Brisbane and Cal Bruton 
I think I had like 27, but I didn't shoot a great percentage. And then we went to Canberra, I played against Phil Smythe and I'm looking, people are telling me about Phil Smythe and I had never seen a picture of him. And I'm looking down the court, it's the little guy with a comb over. I'm like, him, you know, <laughs> this is the, you know, but it didn't take long for me to see that he was a heck of a player, had great hands, big, big, strong hands, got a piece of the ball a lot. You know, he had to really protect it when you, when you went by him, you really, you know, so to put a lot of body on him. And he wasn't used to somebody that was a scoring guard like, like I was. And so um, I think I had 30 that game. I shot it at about 65%. And I remember after the game, my teammates were like, oh, my God. You know, because we got a couple of bad calls. Because back then, you could really get hosed by the referees. <laughs> I'm cooking <laughs> back then. <laughs> oh, <my> yeah. God. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. You could be on the end of some really poor calls. You know, like I've, if one time in particular, Adelaide, one of our guys stepped through a trap. One of the guys, like, he's going that way. One of the guys fell that way, and he got an unsportsmanlike foul. And we had the ball. I don't know how that happened. We ended up losing on the road against Adelaide that was another reason why it was difficult to get the doomsday double back then because you would get no calls when you went to <laughs> Perth or Adelaide See, this is actually probably a good time to bring up the first minute of the game Liam because Ronnie Ratliff just gets spear tackled and there's no <laughs> call and the ball goes out of court I don't oh, yeah. think it was you I think there was another guard that grabbed his legs oh, and they yeah. actually call it a tackle on the commentary oh was yeah I, I failed to mention I felt you know I, I <laughs> I spoke about Adelaide and I spoke about Perth. But I failed to mention that if you didn't beat Hobart by 15, you weren't going to win there. Yeah. Not on our home court. No way. Um, and then, Carf, at the end of this game, mm. Dave Atkins draws, it's like Brad Stevens-esque what he draws up. He says, okay, so at 12 seconds, <laughs> everyone go to that side of the floor and Carp, you go that side and you just win the game for us. Go ahead and win the game. And then you go out, the winner was tough. Real tough. Oh, what do you man. remember about that game winner? I remember the feeling of our team. You know, we're playing, like we had built confidence against good teams. You know, to see us go from a team that didn't know how to win to, you know, we get, you know, some wins early. We get them under our belt. Like I mentioned before, we were beating the top team on the table. We were, we were winning. And so uh, to see our team transform from a team that, you know, no one, no, no, no one wanted our players. We had a team of cast off. So it was to get us to the level where we would compete in a close game was a task. Then to get over that hump was an even bigger task. And then when we're playing in a game where, you know, the team just kept coming at us. We weren't surprising anybody anymore. You know, like they were ready to come in and have a tough one against Hobart in Hobart. And so that was, you know, another task we had to, in, in that game. Um, I was just used to being the guy that was willing to take or to make the last shot or miss it. You know, I was, you know, I wasn't going to, I wasn't getting in my own way, you know, like I felt like I could do it. So on that play in particular, I was just going to go hard and pull up somewhere. And if it was only two guys, I was going to let it fly because I felt like I was confident that I would make that shot. So when I think Ronnie Ratliff kind of, he was either guarding me or came at me, mm -hmm. but I ran right at two guys and just pulled up, leaned back, and it felt good. It felt good the whole time. <laughs> you know, and I think that was my first game winner. You know, like it wasn't like a walk-off one, but it was close to it. Mm -hmm. And that was – that was special to me, you know, like people will say, oh, yeah, look at all the lines on the court. Look at your shorts. You know, they'll make fun of, you know, that the state that basketball was in. I think there was a guy that played for Nunawading named Mike Slusher. He looked like he was 50 mm -hmm. years old. Mm -hmm. He was 20 something. Mm -hmm. um, and I was like, I don't care. You know, that was my first game winner. And, and it was something special. I, and, you know, we, we talk about the passion and we'll probably get into a little bit more in a moment, but like the, the joint erupted. I know 1,200 capacity, a little smaller than the NBL stadiums you see today, but the joint went nuts uh, when you hit the shot. I think the camera operator might have been a huge fan because he just let it go. Uh, so we didn't even see the turnover. It was half on you, had half everyone sort of screaming and going nuts. Uh, we didn't see the turnover that, of course, Brisbane turned it over and the game was done because it was close enough to a walk-off, I think, three or four seconds. So the, the, the electricity in the place, when, when you have so much passion, uh, in the surrounding areas and, and from, the, from the fans. It doesn't matter if it's 1,000 people or 10,000. It still feels the same, and that's what it felt like there. Oh, it did. I mean, you know, like I've played in front of 
uh, 23,000, you know, at Brigham Young when I was in college. And I've played in some loud arenas and one in particular is Purdue. You know, I, it's, a, it's a court that looks like a regular building, but it goes down, it's like in a bowl. And so you go in there and you bounce the ball on the floor and it just echoes and it's loud, you know, like it's one bounce of the ball and the entire arena sounds like it's just like, you know, you're in a sound studio. Um, so I've played in some loud places before, but I, I think you hit it on the, you know, the nail on the head right there, Kim, because um, it was so much emotion. There was so much like, you know, it's Tazzy who doesn't get respect from the mainland. Uh, it's the Hobart Devils who doesn't get respect from the league. Um, it was a, a team that had gone two and 24 and only won eight games in the previous seasons, you know, all together. Um, it was, it was all of that built up into, you know, mm -hmm. these guys are competing with the best in Australia and they're our team, you know, and we were really close with the community. We did everything. We were at meat raffles. We were at everything. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah. so we were a real tight knit community and we felt like they felt like we we're doing it for them. And we felt like they were supporting us. And it was only because they weren't used to the games being sold out. They used to just have general admission. And of course the bar was open. So by the end of the game, yeah. people were pretty lit up, you know, Lubrication so, helps. <laughs> as, Wayne, as Wayne Larkins found out when he went for a loose ball and jumped in the crowd and, you know, a couple of people laid into him a little bit <laughs> and it threw him back out into the court. You know, times were different back then, but, but again, you're super special. And Liam, this leads me into what I want to say in NBL 21. I, I, I want to say a court storm. I want to say the passion of fans get back out there and storm a court after a big, probably unlikely win because it, it adds so much to it. You know, you're doing your, you're doing your post game chat with the commentators. You can barely see the three of you because you just got people rolling on through. We've got kids just rolling in and, and, and yeah. adults just giving you high fives and like literally 10 seconds after you've gone all net to win the game. I mm. want to see that passion from someone in the NBL community. And yeah. if it's, if we have to wait one more year and we see Tasmanians do it when the Devils are back or whatever it might be, that's what I want to see. I want to see it back. <laughs> yeah, well, it resembled a home championship win, right? Yeah, but, it did. And we have, it's been two seasons in a row now where we haven't seen that in the, mm -hmm. in the NBL. So, yeah. um, and Carp, of course, you, you were in Hobart for not for a long time, for a good time. Mm -hmm. Two seasons. <laughs> that year when you went, uh, you got nine wins. Then the following year... So that first year, runner-up MVP to Leroy, mm -hmm. all NBL first team. And then the following year, you guys have a winning record. Oh, so close to making the finals. Another all NBL first team season for you. What do you remember about that 87 season? I remember we had a couple of imports before we got Paul Stanley. And Paul was playing for the Tigers. And I'm not sure if they had him come back. But, I mean, I'm pretty sure he had the fastest 1,000 points in the league history. I mean, He's the greatest, and I've, I've seen some great shooters. I used to go on the road with Shane Heal, and um, somebody would say, oh, you know, if you, you spot me a couple of threes, I could probably beat you. And you know, he'd run off like 27 straight, you know, so Shane's a great shooter, obviously. There's no mystery to that. But Paul Stanley, I was with him at every training session, and he was just money. I'm pretty sure he shot 49% or 50% from the field that year. He just, he was, he was a great shooter. And he, you know, like when I went from being the man to getting him the ball, he was that, he was, he was that potent from the perimeter. And we had recruited a couple of players that made us a better team. Like Wayne Burden had come over from the Supersonics. And we got a couple of guys from other teams um, who gave us a little bit more off the bench. And so um, I remember us feeling as if, you know, we had to, do better than the previous year and we had more personnel so we could pass the basketball around a little bit more the first year it was just Jeff Akers and I and if he wasn't passing to me I was passing to him or he'd bring the ball up and you know the other guys we'd hit them for layups but we pretty much didn't let them touch the ball because we were last in the league in rebounding but we had the least amount of turnovers than any league any team in the league because we we took care of the ball. We, we just didn't leave a whole lot for, you know, for chance. Um, and I remember right away that we felt like, you know, if we played, if everyone stayed within their role, we could win games. Mm -hmm. And for me, it was no problem for me to, you know, pull back in my role 
and be more of a distributor. That's more my natural game anyway. I see the floor, I understand, I can see matchups, all that type of stuff. That was always one of my stronger suits as a player. So I was able to ease back into it. The, the hardest thing for that was when you have the fluorescent green light, you know that, and you know that you have to hit shots for your team to win. You kind of second guess yourself if you, you miss a couple of them when you have a score right next to you. Mm -hmm. And so I, my shooting percentage went way down. I just didn't have that confidence mm -hmm. um, when I was shooting the basketball like I did the previous year, but I felt like, and, and people didn't understand the game back then. I remember I was criticizing the paper. We had won the game and I had like 18, 10 and, and nine or something, just missed a triple double. And I don't even know if people made a big deal out of triple doubles back then, it was so long ago. But I felt like I had my best game for, as a devil. I was all rain. I, I was usually the safety. When a shot went up, I'd run and cover the break. So it was rare that I would have that many rebounds. I had a fantastic game. I must have had like four or five steals. And I just had a great game. And then I was criticized by if I had more points, we would have beaten this team by more. And I thought, this. I'm looking at our team. I'm like, they should never say we should beat a team by yeah. more. You know, like they should feel <laughs> got to win. And it was just a little a bit of an adjustment to go back into a lesser role. One that I was happy to do because we were winning games. We're, you know, we're over 500. Yeah. And so it was a lot of fun to um, do what I did best, make people around me better, which is one thing I felt like I did with the Sydney Kings. You know, I felt like Damian Keogh without me, nah, wouldn't have made the Australian team. Tim Morrissey would have never made an Australian team if I didn't tell him, hey, you run the floor, I'll get you double figures. You know, like this guy couldn't shoot, couldn't dribble, and couldn't pass. And he made it, I think he made an Australian team above Shane Hill once, you know. So it was like, I felt like, okay, that's my role. My role is to make people around me better. I always respected players that did that, had the ability to, once they stepped on the court, people ran the lanes harder, people made harder cuts. You know, like you encourage them to block out, do the little things of the game, show them appreciation for doing the little one percenters. I felt like that was part of my game. And that was one of the reasons why that team, that, that second year in Hobart was special to me because I felt like I was a major part of us overachieving. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It, there's a lot of passion. We talk about Hobart, we talk about Tasmania. There's a lot of passion, a lot of excitement. It still comes out of your voice to this day talking about it. It's obviously... A, it's got a small piece of your heart and, and the news, of course, that we're going to see a Tasmanian team back in the NBL must have warmed it when the announcement was made. Yeah, you know, I was just recently in Hobart and um, we went to Fresnay, you know, like, what is that called? Wine Glass Bay or whatever it may be. It's beautiful. It is beautiful. And it's like, they do a great job with tourism there. And it's because it's kind of like you can still go to a, a bakery that's only open for six hours, you know, like it, it, it is and get like a Devonshire tea, you know, things like that. So it's got a bit of that old fashioned, like it was when I was there in the eighties. Um, they've got all these historic buildings. Um, I, I had a wonderful time when I was there, but when I was there, it was um, Taste of Tasmania. Mm -hmm. So went to the Salamanca markets while we were there and they had the Taste of Tasmania going the whole time that we were there. And I was blown away at how many people recognized me. Like, blown away. Now, you know, I had a bit of a fro that bounced when I ran, so I had a lot more <laughs> hair. So I wouldn't expect that too many people would remember me. And plus, it was 1986. You know, like, most of the people that I run into, even the teachers at this school, mm -hmm. weren't even born. You know, like, the young teachers weren't even born. <laughs> so it was quite a surprise that, that people recognized me. So. I'm I'm officially going to put it out there yeah. that I am interested in being, because I, I have such fond memories and hell, people still recognize me. Um, I am officially putting it out there that I would love to be an ambassador for the Hobart Devils in their return of the NBL. Well, you know what? This is becoming too easy, Liam, because last week we yeah. spoke to John Really, We were like, hey, you know what? We want, him, we want you back in Australia. We should be have the coach. Now we've got the ambassador pretty much locked away, at least one of them. This is becoming it. Hey. Thank you, because it's, it's making our job easier. And, of course, Liam and I 
I'm assuming it's some type of commission, small commission kickbacks when all these things happen. And this is a no-brainer <laughs> appointment. Oh, of course. I'm, you know, I'm in yeah. here with the charisma and the, mm-hmm. and the identity and the, the, the mm-hmm. history in Tassie. That, that's just got to happen. I want to ask, though, you talked about the move to Sydney. That, that, did that end up in court? What, what happened there when you went to the Kings? <laughs> <laughs> what this I was I was um, there was an option on my contract to play a third season there so you know I was just planning on going back so I had gone home to my family we had lost to Canberra on the road and they beat us pretty pretty easy um, Canberra had a very good team and like I said we just weren't sneaking up on people you know they were prepared for us we were a different team when we were on the road than we were at we were at home um, I didn't play very well. I think I had like 11 points and, and, you know, like, it's not like you can't have a good game with 11 points, but my role on that team was an attacking role and I just didn't shoot a good percentage and didn't make a whole lot of great. I just didn't play well and, you know, give credit to Phil Smythe who's, you know, uh, a very capable opponent. So it wasn't like uh, I just didn't play well because I, didn't play well, you know, like he had a big hand and getting his hand and being disruptive and forcing me to, to help. And, um, and so, you know, we lost. And and so I go home and, and then I'm I'm planning on coming back. I'm just going to do whatever I did in the off season and work on my game and play in pickup games and play in different summer leagues, the Crenshaw league, the Compton college league. And then I get this letter from Hobart saying that, you know, if I had played better, we would have made the playoffs and, I just was like, this is so so unfair and so unrealistic, you know, because like I said before, I felt like that was a team that had overachieved more than any team that I had ever played on. And so I was, you know, like my ego was was really dented on that one. And I just, you know, I got really pissed off and just thought, how ungrateful, you know, like I've done everything for this city and for this coach and for this team and, you know, to get a letter like that. I think that, um, you know, I spoke with Dave Atkins, you know, years later, and he said, oh, I just felt like you're getting too big for your britches and, you know, you needed, you know, to get stung a little. And I, I don't think that he thought that I would go public with that. And I just, you know, because I think a radio station had called me to see how I was doing. And I told them about the letter and, and then, you know, like it just blew up in the media in, in Hobart. And then I went on a um, one of those season trips where you play against college teams in America, mm-hmm. I, I went with the Illawarra Hawks and they found out that I was going to leave Hobart. So they recruited me. And then um, Mike Robleski heard about it, who was forming um, the West stars and the supersonics to make the Sydney Kings in 88. And so he flew, he was in the U S at the time. So he flew and met me um, at the airport in Chicago and he wrote out, by hand a contract and I signed it right there I thought it was exciting to play in Sydney I loved Sydney I wanted an opportunity to and I enjoy being a part of something that is at the early stages so I I felt like you know with my personality and 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 like you mentioned uh, kindly mentioned there um, Liam is my and my charisma that that would be something that I could really um, use to my benefit in Sydney a team that's starting out and and doing promotions and doing schools and all the things that I was good at, I thought that I could really make an impact there. And that's how I got to Sydney. Oh, you, oh, I'm sorry. You asked me about the court case. Yeah. How close did it come to you not being able to play Mm. in that first ever Kings game? Well, there were preseason games that I missed out on because it was in court. Now, like I'm in court, they're trying to get $50,000 from me to clear me to play for the Sydney Kings. And so I'm there with, and I've never been in court before in my life, much less an Australian court where the guy's wearing the white wig and everything. And, wow. and so I'm sitting in the court and they call me up to the stand and I was just like, well, I know that their sponsor, Cascade, only put in $40,000 to be the naming rights sponsor. So they wanted more for me than they did the naming rights sponsor. And so I think that, and I had the letter that showed that they were saying that my future was in question in Hobart. And so that was the evidence, I guess they thought that I wouldn't hang on to. And so the, the case pretty much got thrown out and I was able to play the next week was, I believe was the Kmart classic. Right, we, right. You know, my first team, the first game I played for the Sydney Kings was against a team from um, New Zealand with Kerry Boagney 
um, who was a McDonald's All-American from Sarah High School in, in Los Angeles. And so, um, yeah, that was my first game for Sydney. Wow. So you said you had a player option. I mean, player options, it's a lot more of a smoother process <laughs> yeah. to exercise your rights. You don't end up in court so much these days. Oh, man. Uh, it, was, it, was a, it was definitely a, an eye-opening experience for me. But, um, you know, I, I mean, I, 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 can't, I, can't, um, I can't tell you how much fun it is for me to – I haven't thought about these things in years. <laughs> for me to actually have a conversation about it, for you guys to bring these things up, and for me to, oh, yeah, that's right. There was a court case on me. So, um, yeah, it was, it was quite an experience and, and, and quite um, – Let's see, what's the word I'm looking for? But it was, it was quite flattering to see, you know, all of this, you know, it was, I was in court and they were talking about me, you know, I was right. a property that they were fighting over. Right. You know, it was interesting. What did you, you mentioned the excitement, being a part of the Sydney Kings and its inception, uh, obviously a couple of years at Sydney, what, what was it like? Was it everything you expected it to be? Of course, you had your injuries later and which we'll touch on, but what was it like? Did it, did it fulfill all your expectations of being a part of the Kings? Well, not right away. You know, the first year in 1988, you know, Mike Robleski came in. We lost a couple of games. He came in the locker room and was like, you know, you guys are so good. You guys don't even need a coach. I thought, oh, my God, if that's what he thinks, then we're in a lot of trouble, you know, because we're coming up against, you know, Brian Gorgens with Eastside. We're coming up against Bruce Palmer, who's with North Melbourne. And we're coming against, you know, I, I, I remember, you know, the coach saying, I'm getting double teamed because – you know, they don't want the ball. They don't, you know, outlet pass. I got two guys on me. Inbounds plays, I got two guys on me. So they're trying to get the ball out of my hand so we don't get any transition baskets. And, and so, you know, I say to Bob Turner, I'm like, look, we need to have somebody, you know, come up the court, throw it to him. I'll get a run and start because they're fronting me. And so he's like, oh, you know, I don't, don't worry about it. Um, you just got to work harder. You know, so I'm like, yeah. You know, so it was, it was not an easy – it, was, it, it wasn't easy at first. I think we may have gone 500 my first year in 88. And then 89, Bob Turner comes. He, he brings um, Ian Rebilliard in mm -hmm. and gave us just a little bit more guidance as to, um, you know, what to do as a team, what were our strengths, what were our roles. Um, and we were like 10 and 1 at one point, you know, before Mark Dalton got hurt in 89. And that was the year that, um, you know, I'll mention it now, but for years, I wouldn't even talk about it. That was the year that we made it all the way to the semifinal game three against Canberra and got beat by 60 the same day that North Melbourne um, beat Cam uh, sorry, beat Perth by 55. Mm. You know, like, I, I still, I, I don't have the nerve to look at those games. You know, like, it was like a, and I remember how, how, it, how the onslaught just started I got a steal and I came down and I went to do my little jump on one side and lay it up on the other. Emory Atkinson had both sides covered. He was like, <laughs> so he just blocked it, <laughs> caroms off, they go the other way. And at that, that play right there just started. Right. They were up by 44 at halftime. Right. We, we saw that in Melbourne this year. You know right? how that happened. Yeah, we did. We saw that in game two of the semifinals when – the on th it just it was an avalanche with the, with United over the Kings. Oh yeah, I mean it was like when you're a part of that, and I, I always have a lot of empathy for, you know, for guys and the, their their body language when that's happening to them because that's happened to me before. Mm. It's it's like whatever you do, like if you you know you're okay, we're gonna pick up the intensity of a timeout and you call a play, and, you know, and, and a team is running something, and you know you go out there and you put your hand in a pass and lane and hit your elbow, hit your knee, bounces back to them. They get it and score. It was like one of those games. Right. Everything went their way. I, Shot hit, bounce off the rim twice and go in. You know, it was like, <laughs> are we going to get a break here? And then it was like, we couldn't get the ball. Couldn't get it. We couldn't even get it past half court. You know, something would happen. A guy would fall. You know, he'd trip off of a guy's foot. No call. Um, dunk crowd going crazy call another timeout we throw the ball away it was oh my goodness that's just the stuff my brain will allow me to remember well well, well does your brain allow you to recall what was said at halftime like you're 44 down what is a halftime locker room like that in a deciding game like, like what can the coach say well it was bob turner and he mm -hmm. said look 
we're clearly not going to win this game. <laughs> At least he was honest. <laughs> that's, that's the first time any coach has ever said that. I mean, you know, I'm not saying he shouldn't have said it because it's <laughs> right. really true. He said, let's try and go out there and let's not complain. I thought it was a good halftime speech. He said, Let, let's not complain about the refs. Let's not get frustrated. Let's show our professionalism and our class. We'll go out there and play hard. We'll try and win the second half. Right. And, and you know, let's just, let's, just, let's just play under those parameters. And yep. we did that. And I felt like, um, you know, Canberra were the better team. You know, even when we won, we had an exceptional game. I had 30. Mark Ridlin had 30 in, in game two. Because we lost in Sydney at home. Then we beat them on the road and to force a game three. Um, and I remember thinking, man, we can't play much better than that. And when, you know, we, when we beat them in game two. And they played, you know, when you get beat, you get humbled and you go back to what you do well. Yep. And Amber were super deep and they just kept coming at us with waves of fresh legs and mm. different styles. And Tad Dufelmeyer was a real scorer for them. And he was embarrassed in game two and came out and hit his first couple of shots. And he was – you know, his mojo was going. I was like, we could be in a little trouble here, boys. And that's exactly what happened. I didn't know we were in trouble to the tune of 60 points. Mm -hmm. But uh, they were the better team. And um, that was the best two teams went at each other in that series. And they were the best two teams all year, North, North Melbourne and, and Canberra. The, the back problems. After the 91 season, you, of course, retire at just age 29, mm -hmm. like – were you, were you done? How bad were they? Um, I think that if it had happened in this day and age, you know, I would have been able to play more. Um, it all went back to, I went up to block uh, Mike Ellis' shot back in 1986. And I land, I get, our feet got tangled up and I landed in a seated position and, you know, I had like that sciatic nerve, you know, problem. And I, I think I came back a little too early because you know, my team needed me. And, you know, it would flare up every now and then. I'd feel something going down the back of my leg. And then in the preseason of 91, you know, it was like it was dancing around. It would go down my left hamstring and then it would go down like my right calf. And then I would, it was, it was all over the shop. And everyone, it was, it was like I was complaining about something different mm. every day. And it wasn't overt, you know, like I was bent over, I couldn't walk. It wasn't anything like that. But I just felt like I had absolutely no pop in my legs. And I had made a career on being explosive and quick. Mm. Um, you know, I hadn't really developed a game of deception where I'm pump faking and, you know, pivoting around and using my footwork that much. I would, I had, you know, relied on my speed. Mm. And, you know, Liam, when you're, when you're undersized, and you got no pop in your legs, mm -hmm. it ain't good, you know? <laughs> <laughs> and so, um, you know, I was, I was trying to find out what was wrong with me. And then finally, you know, the team doctor, you know, said, look, I, I, I've got an idea of what I think it is. And so, you know, did the scans and um, went in that little thing that, you know, cause I'm a little claustrophobic, you know, when you go in that thing and mm -hmm. it's like Draw this. Yeah. So, I go in there and, and then the word is, you know, what my problem is. And, and I had studied, um, I had studied, you know, communications and, and I had worked at the Tasmanian Film Corporation when I was in Hobart, my second year there. And, and I was, when I got injured, I was like, well, you know, like I'll come back, I'll play. And, um, in 92, Channel 7 lost the rights and Channel 10 got the rights from them. And I auditioned for the TV job. And then when I got it, I thought, well, this is what I wanted to do when my career was up anyway. And I, and because I'm a younger brother, my, my brother's four years older, and I, and I had experienced a lot of things that I was going through four years previous, you know? So comebacks were rarely good, you know? Back injuries rarely came good. So I just thought, well, let me take this opportunity and run with it. Just let me get some experience before I go back home. And then I'll try and get a job in television when I go back there. Um, and then in television, my big break comes when they had the NBA jam session. And mm. 
I'm dyslexic, so I, I struggle with like, re, you know, reading, especially reading the auto cue in front of live national television, you know, so, um, so I got really good at improvising. That was my way of getting past reading when I was in school and, um, you know, interviews, probably that's why I'm a little mo bit more, I can, I'm a storyteller because right. you know, my instinct is, okay, I don't read well, but, you know, I better be able to be animated and tell a story. So, um, I was able to get those interviews and extract a lot of information out of guys. And um, I think that because I knew a couple of them, um, it was kind of like they gave me a bit more. And so Channel 10 saw that as, wow, let's get this guy his own show. I had Hoops TV after that. And, and my, tel my television career just kind of came out of nowhere. And I, was, and I was able to just, you know, get one opportunity after another. And, um, you know, people will say to me now, like, oh, are you still commentating sound? I said, look, and I had a dream run, you know, in television. Um, my life's forked in another direction now, you know, like the director of basketball at a private school, Barker College in Sydney, and, and I love it. Um, but, uh, you know, what you guys do, you know, I, you know, I have to be a genius to figure out you guys love it. You know, I see that look in your eye. You guys are, you know, you research, you, you talk about stuff and you have people on and it's, it's a dream gig, you know. So, you know, I experienced that for a long time. And, and so I've had, you know, I've had just a, a fantastic run as a player, you know, in television. And now in this position that I'm in right now, the brand new facility at this private school watching, you know, young kids, you know, try and get to the next level. You know, it's, it's, it's been amazing. And I think I mentioned it off the top. So many of these NBL Rewind games we're going back to watch involves yourself and, and John Casey and that, that wonderful duo for such a long period of time. I'm going to put you on the spot here. It is one game you could go back and relive as a commentator. Is there one that stands out for you? I thought you might ask me that. <laughs> I knew you'd be ready. <laughs> <laughs> I'm ready for that one. So John Casey was an all-arounder as far as a commentator. So he would do athletics. He would do boxing. He loves boxing. You know, he's, he's like an encyclopedia when it comes to athletics, swimming, and boxing. And so he was our, our best commentator at Fox Sports. And so he was off doing something else. And... Illawarra or Wollongong were playing against Adelaide and that was the Damon Lowry free throws that bounced around on the rim and went down mm -hmm. and I wasn't the regular commentator I was just I had talked um our producer was um um American girl named Ellen and uh Ellen Green Ellen Greenwood and so I had talked her into letting me try to do the play-by-play -play because they would get Warren Smith who's a footy commentator to come in and and he would he would uh, sub for John Casey whenever he was doing another sport. But earlier that year, I had talked her into letting me do the the play by play. And so, cause I just wanted to try it. Mm -hmm. And so um, I had, you know, my number got called up earlier in the year. I had had a couple of games. So when that came up, they just said, all right, Steve, you're going to do play by play. John Casey's going to be doing athletics or boxing. And I was like, okay. And so this game comes on. It's a, it's, it's a classic, you know, like, yeah. It's probably the most dramatic finish ever. Yeah. We, we, we had, we've had Damon on this show about a month ago and he talked us through every single second of it. <laughs> Unreal. I know, I saw that show. You know, <laughs> <laughs> how his arm was dislocated. And yeah. <laughs> but he had the, you know, like, in, you know, like it's, um, you guys had the, the game winning shot I had of Brisbane, of course. But that was my game winning shot of commentary was that one right there calling the yeah. Damon Lowry free throws. And, mm -hmm. and then when they went on to play against Townsville, we had Damon on the show. We had a live show after the game in like the function room that they have in Townsville. And so I remember uh, Damon Lowry and I said to him, the question was, you know, as, as uh, a host of a show, you remember, do you remember your questions? Like I just, you know, I just recently saw the one that I did with Luke Longley and it had a lot of the last dance type stuff on there. Yes. And you know, when you ask a question and they give you a fantastic answer, that's like hitting a home run, isn't it? It's like hitting a walk-off homer. You're like, oh yeah. Or they go, yeah, that's a really good question, Liam. Or that's a, you know, oh, thanks. I'm glad you brought that up. <laughs> you know, so anyway, uh, so uh, that was like, uh, 
um, oh yeah, so to got a little sidetracked, but then he goes, he said, I asked him a question. I was like, what, what made you, you know, in the fourth quarter, you hadn't hit a shot in three quarters. You know, what makes you shoot those shots down the stretch in the comeback? He was like, you know what I was thinking, Steve? It was like, I thought, why not me? Why not right now? And I, rem I'll, I'll remember that answer. You know, like it was another one of those, you know, so I had two of my best moments in, in, in hosting a show or in commentary. I've been with Damon Lowry, you know, because he's such great talent, you know, mm -hmm. because he, he, he's a great storyteller and he's a great character. And, and uh, those are my two favorite things. Yeah, he's the best. We asked him um, about that, how there was no time left on the clock with those shots, you know, and like if that, that there probably should have been and David Stiff would have knocked the, uh, the ball off. And he said, if there had been time on the clock, I would have switched all three yeah. of them. <laughs> yeah, that's what I think he's, I've heard him say a couple of different things. Like, you know, anybody can swish him. <laughs> right, right. To bounce them around several times. Uh, you mentioned that that interview with with Luke that got pulled out of the vault recently, and and they put the division on top of it. Had that last dance feel. What do you remember about that sit down? Well, I remember um, Andrew Vlahov talking to me beforehand. He said, you know, Luke's Luke. Luke was quite truculent, you know, and it and it didn't surprise me when he wasn't on the last dance, you know, because. You know, he's, he, he's a very private guy, you know, so, um, and I, was, I felt like, oh, you know, it's a bit of a shame that we didn't hear Luke's stories because, you know, he was quite good with me. We went to his hotel room, it was at the, at the casino um, at Crown, and so we went to his, to his room and, and, and Luke, um, sorry, and uh, Andrew Vlahoff had said, you look, you probably won't get much out of him, but, you know, he'll be polite, but he, you know, he won't elaborate. So be ready with a whole lot of questions. Mm. And so, um, I'm right next to a classroom if you guys are hearing stuff. So that's what's going on. So, um, so I'm, I'm there, I'm prepared. I've got all, you know, I've got uh, all these questions. And I asked him, I can't remember what I asked him first. And he gave me like a really elaborate, passionate answer and he just you know had like a couple of layers to it so basically my questions were you know out the window and he gave like that great Michael Jordan story about being a predator he talked about practice he talked about um, one of the things they didn't show on that clip was when he spoke about you know he was like a white guy from another country they hardly spoke to him you know like he was kind of alienated and I just thought, wow, you know, like I always thought of this as like a close knit team, mm -hmm. you know, that won more games than anybody at that point in time. But that was, yeah, you know, you guys have got me on that one. That one, my favorite commentary one was Damon Lowry. My favorite interview was Luke Longley by a long shot. And probably because I wasn't expecting much. And the first answer, Adam Howarth was my producer back then at Fox Sports. And he started answering the question. I look over at Adam like, oh man, I get in the front of my seat, like, here we go. Right. You know, like, you know, you're a part of something really special and timeless. And I felt it right away. So when the last dance was, was running and the, everyone, the media all across the nation here were talking about Luke and how he's not in it. And we'd love to hear from him about all these stories. You were thinking the tape's got to be there somewhere. Yeah, you know, and it's 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 kind of like um, I just had a chat with Mark Slocum not too long ago, and I just said, you know, I need to get my hands on a few things because I think that you know, like as as you get older, you know, like I said earlier about being drafted, you know, you think of your achievements and you're like, wow, you're pretty proud of yourself, you know, as time goes on. Mm -hmm. And with that last dance one, I think that I just kind of lost track of a lot of things and. And I, you know, I don't bring up things like that too often. I don't want my kids to feel like there's pressure on them because their dad did this and their dad did that. So, you know, I would downplay a lot of things that had happened in my life. And, and I was thinking exactly that. And I just thought, mm, how's that going to come across? You know, right. because, you know, even with, um, you know, chatting to you guys, um, you know, I, you know, I love watching you guys. I love coming to the game, you know, um, I love that I had a great run, but I don't like to make too much of a big deal. Like 
I'm trying to get back in it, you know? So I was kind of laid off of it a little bit, like, okay, my life's moved on. Maybe, you know, like somebody else will find it. So when someone found it and sent me the link, I was like, oh, yes. (laughs) (laughs) That's great. Yeah, I mean. It wasn't wasn't anything that I had to pursue and I had to draw attention to myself because it wasn't about me. It was about he gave some of the best information, you know, and I felt like, man, he really should have been a part of that last yeah. act. Because it Actually, was really though, it was also about you. Like you did the, the feel of the comp. It wasn't, it was less of an interview and more of a conversation, but it, but it was a Q and A. Your ability to conduct a Q and A, ask mm-hmm. him direct questions um, in a way that felt like a conversation and that made him comfortable to tell those stories. Like it was a dance. Yeah. Yeah, it was. And, you know, and, and you guys, you guys have been, you know, doing this show and you guys, you know, like I had a show once a week and you guys get an opportunity to do this a lot, you know, and this, in this new era, there's an opportunity, you know, like even in COVID, you guys are doing, you know, podcasts, you're doing it on your computer, you know, like there's an opportunity more often. So you get really, you know, it's like a, a poker player who's, you know, plays, you know, one hand at a time. And now the modern day poker player, you know, is playing 17 hands at once. So he's getting his experience a lot quicker, you know, but early in my career, I admired um, people who weren't always trying to show off how much they knew, Mm -hmm. you know, like you have to, sometimes you have to, you know, like someone is a a reluctant speaker. And so therefore, they're not giving you much. So you really have to have information, you know, in front of you or stored up in this research that you've done. And you've got to, you got to help them along. You got to remind them of something. You got to have stories and you have to be able to recall it quickly, you know, without staring down at your notes the whole time, especially when you're on television. Um, and that takes a skill, you know, but it also takes a skill to, to sit back and, okay, we're, you know, he's given some great answers. I don't want to ask him the same thing over because I'm trying to stick to a pattern here. I'm like, this is a conversation. And, and I always felt like that was, you know, when, when I have people on the show, I always felt like I could get, or I interviewed somebody at halftime, not always, but when I interviewed somebody at halftime, they, I had, I had their respect because I had done it over. It wasn't about me. It was about, you know, like if they were kind of glad, say like Kevin Lish, how he never takes credit for anything. Mm -hmm. I'd be like, come on, you're on fire. You know, like I would say something about, oh, pretty good half. Because I didn't want to give him an answer in my question. I'd say pretty good half, Kevin. He's like, oh, yeah, the guy's got me the ball. And, you know, I'm like, come on, man. You had, you had 12 in the first quarter. And he'd laugh and he'd say something like that. And I always felt like that was always fun for me to, to draw out more of their personality than, right. than the next guy, you know, than somebody else would. That was always uh, – a real kind of moment for me like oh yeah um they look like they enjoyed that time with you you know like they they look like they had fun you know it's like when i watch graham norton i love that because mm-hmm. people do and say things on that show that they would never <laughs> say you know like he makes them feel comfortable he does kind of you know get them on the grog first but but he has a real ability that is a real ability to get people to to tell stories and share things that they they normally wouldn't share yeah. And that was, and that, that's how I felt about that interview. It was real. Again, another very special moment. Wonderful. We've had a ball. We've had a blast. You talk about having a conversation and, and looking back and enjoying it. That's what Liam and I get to do each and every week and a couple of times. And it's been no different today. It's been brilliant talking about Hobart, the Tasmanian days, of course, Sydney, and then into your media world. And of course, at the end of it, we're going to get you an ambassador role for the new Tassie team as well. So, you know, you know what? This thing's going to keep on giving. And as always, we appreciate all the great work you've done, which we've touched on, and uh, also as much having a chat with us, mate. So we look forward to uh, doing it again sometime real soon. Oh, okay. My pleasure. And um, great job of you guys, um, you know, especially during this period of COVID and you guys doing podcasts and working from home and your computer. Great job of, um, you know, understanding the history of the league. I think that... Um, uh, I, I think it's great when when sports can recognize the history of the league and embrace that and and just get that um, just that 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 history just makes it special makes it historic so and I think you guys have done a great job of that. No, we really enjoyed it. Thanks, Thank you. Man. We've enjoyed sort of exposing it to a new generation of NBL fans as well. Yeah. How good it was in the early days. Hashtag NBL Rewind to get involved. If you haven't seen the game, get involved right now. Twitch, NBL TV, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter. 
wherever you get your content. Isolation conversation this week is you and Sam Froling. Is that right, mm-hmm. Liam? Mm-hmm. There you go. NBL Overtime back next week. Until then, see ya.